Sean Duggan is with me, Chief Executive of the Mental Health Network, which is part of the NHS Confederation. Hello, Sean. Good afternoon. Very Thank good you for having me on. No, no, absolutely uh, delighted. I was reading a little bit of what you were saying uh, earlier on about uh, what we might expect going forward. But just tell people uh, what uh, the NHS Confederation is first. Establish your credentials, Sean. Yes, of course. Just to say, cutting out slightly, so I hope uh, your listeners can hear me okay. Um, the NHS Confederation is a membership organisation, and in my case, uh, we focus in on mental health. So it includes the Mental Health NHS Trusts across the country, of which there are over 50, and it includes um, voluntary charity organisations that provide mental health services from NHS funding and also the independent sector. Okay, and and what are what are we facing at the moment? How much has the demand uh, during COVID gone down for mental health services? Has there been a decline? Yeah, so so it's a complicated uh, picture, but simply put, during the start of COVID, and you mentioned this at the uh, start of your introduction, uh, people less inclined to well, they were locked down, so we, we were all locked down, so they were less inclined to go into the NHS, and that included some of the mental health services. So we did see a reduction in, in referrals, and that lasted for a little while. We knew, that's the, as the leaders in, in the mental health sector, we knew that this wouldn't last, um, because what we know from past uh, incidences and crises, uh, for example, a recession, is that there will be an increase in, in these for mental health services and people do suffer when there's uncertainty, when there's jobs prospects uh, that are uncertain and uh, tightening of uh, budget. So those are all factors that we know there'll be an increase in demand. So at the beginning there was a reduction but now we're back to referrals the same as we were pre-COVID and we are preparing for an increase in demand. And, and how easy is it or how difficult and demanding is it and what is the best way to, um, to, to get a hold of mental health services that you need? Presumably GP is the first point of call. Yeah, I mean, there, there are two, two aspects that are probably worth, you know, we, we talk about, um, you know, uh, the difficulties with COVID and isolation and, you know, losing loved ones during COVID and having some uncertainties. Now, these are sort of, it's very intense and we've not experienced this in our generation, but these are normal factors in life that we usually deal with quite well. Uh, so it is about, uh, the first instance, it's about self-care, it's looking after each other, looking after our families and employers looking after their staff mental health well-being. If it then sort of develops into uh, mental health issues where you need help, the first protocol used to be GP still is, that's the gatekeeper going through primary care and your GP, but mental health is now so much more talked about and so much more high profile. There's a variety of uh, helplines that you can just talk to people that in the know, because um, quite often it's just about talking about it, unloading what the issues are from yourself. There are lots of uh, helplines, and with during COVID, uh, mental health organisations have organised uh, quite a lot of crisis centres, crisis areas, crisis helplines, so you, you can get help in a crisis. Yeah. Uh, what we try and do, though, is prevent the crisis and, and get help a bit earlier. You've just talked about employers um, and, and th how they should look after the well-being, the personal well-being of, of those who work for them. I mean, in a lot of industries I've worked in, um, freelance for 30 years, that's cloud cuckoo land, but, I mean, that's not an insult, that's just the way it is. There's no, there is, there is no uh, provision for that, and, and I would never expect it. And a vast amount of people in our economy, of course, are, are self-employed, they're contractors, they're freelancers, they're on, the, on their own. Um, so, so there's millions of people that don't, don't, don't come into that. And I, and I think another observation I might make is that, you know, how do I know whether I'm just anxious um, just upset as I get a lot of the time uh, on a personal level for for not just myself but actually far more for my for my children. H how, what's the difference between that and being poorly? Yeah, so so just to comment on on the uh, workforce, uh, things and and uh, employees things have moved on so much. We we did have uh, a, a very um, prolific. Uh, stigma attached to mental health that's been 
smashed by by all sorts of campaigns of course the royal family have helped enormously so it, it's much more easier to talk about it i mean even in the commercial world and, and the world of business and banks there are alliances with big employers that are looking after the mental health of their workforce because they know that if they do that their productivity will increase um so it's starting to move in in, in the well, right that's, way that, that that's good news but i would reiterate my point and i don't know whether this will be borne out by people who might wish to call about this but i I, I still think that that's, uh, I think we're taking the very, very just baby steps on, on that right. I mean, people, especially males, I think, would never, ever admit in a work environment they've got an issue like that, and let alone go to their bosses. Most, I mean, so many people are hired on contract anyway. Next time it comes up for a contract, people will say, well, I'm not going to hire that nutter. He was nothing but trouble. This is, I mean, that is the reality of the situation, is that employers, the last thing they want to do is deal with somebody that has an issue. So the evidence is when we've done uh, studies on this and asked people, the evidence is there is a movement and it's positive. Well, but you're good. quite right. We're, we're certainly not there yet. We're absolutely certainly not there. And you do mention, you're quite right. You mentioned people that are self-employed, working on their own, freelancers. That, that's different because you don't have the corporate nothing, uh, health nothing. of uh, occupational health and things like that. But but um, you know we we need to provide then we need to provide services in the community where people can get some help. The other thing that's uh, for people that um, are really busy and they're freelancing, there are there's a lot of digital uh, applications now. A lot of them free self help apps and things that online. There's there's so much uh, available so that that is and people are finding that extremely useful. You you, you asked about um, how do you know? Well. You may not know. That's it. that's the trouble with with this um, with some some of the mental health issues. When you're you're not sure whether you're you're actually getting to the point where it requires some clinical help. Th that stage, go and get some help. Just talk to your GP. Talk to somebody at the practice. Get on a helpline and and talk it through because you might need a, an objective opinion. And is it is it true to say that men are more likely to feel the need to access these sorts of services and are less inclined to go and get help than women? It used to be the case. It's a, it's a, again a little bit more complicated now. So, so for example, uh, you know we're we're worried about young girls with self harming um, for all sorts of reasons. That might be the case. We're worried about that group now. We we worried about men in different age groups, and it does change. Um, so I think you know I think just a blanket male to female is is not correct. There are just different pressures yes. depending on the gender. And when it comes to uh, access accessing, let let's talk about adolescent. Uh, mental health services, CAMS, I mean, the amount of times that we've spoken about this on, on LBC and elsewhere, the, the, the difficulty in getting joined up care for people who really need it, be it uh, an eating disorder, uh, other forms of anxiety or depression showing up, it, 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 I mean, I don't know if it's any more streamlined now than it was the last time I spoke about it a few months ago, but um, perhaps you can tell me. Yeah, no, I mean, absolutely. I, I totally agree with you. The area that we're most concerned about is children and young people. Just a tiny bit of background that this is one area that's been um, very badly invested in over the years. Uh, I remember working in it, leading the service of CAMS many, many years ago, and we really didn't invest in it. That's come to bite us now. Um, there is governments have uh, got, got to or starting to get to grips with this. They have put money in, into it, but it is going to take a while to get it right to get the services in place because it. Because in terms of, you know, some of the uh, children and young people present with very complex uh, yes, disorders indeed. and, indeed. and it, requ it requires sort of specialist doctors, yeah. nurses. So there are quite a lot of challenges, but at least there is investment into this. My, but one thing I'd say yes, sure. is there is a bit more help. There is a bit more help in schools now. So we're looking to... Uh, train uh, and, and develop teachers so they know a bit about mental health awareness and yeah. the on when need be. So there's some uh, help. And as if, as yeah. if they haven't got enough to contend with, but I, I, I take your point and that and it has to be a good thing. It's a pleasure. Thanks, Sean. Uh, Sean Dogan is Chief Executive of the Mental Health Network, part of the NHS uh, Confederation.